So I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Grant Whitehoff. I'm a uh, postdoc here in the Society of Fellows in the Humanities. Um, and on behalf of Alex, uh, Dennis, and uh, Manon, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Barbara Hernstein Smith, who is the Braxton Craven Professor of Comparative Literature and English at Duke University, um, who will round out uh, for us what has been um, an incredibly uh, productive, generative uh, series of talks um, on method in the humanities, a lecture series that uh, began for us as an attempt to throw into historical relief some of the perceived changes um, we're undergoing today uh, in, the, in humanities research methodologies as a result of um, digital media. Um, so following Thomas Kuhn, the question for us when we started this series was how we can outline uh, paradigms of humanistic inquiry. What are the national specificities of those methods? How are the technological challenges and opportunities provided by new research methods, um, like computational and quantitative, uh, and new organizational structures like labs and workshops tethered to uh, epistemological shifts as well? Um, and if you're interested in learning uh, more about the series and the Group for Experimental Methods in the Humanities here at Columbia, um, we're online at xpmethod.plaintext.in, um, where you can check out uh, the sort of press you for the series there. Um, and if anybody is on Twitter, maybe talking about this lecture tonight, the hashtag will be xpmethod, singular method. Um, so just for those of you who couldn't attend all the uh, lectures, a, a brief roundup of the talks we've had so far. Uh, way back in November, we began with Joe Gouldy, who uh, kicked us off with an introduction to the Paper Machines Toolkit uh, to give scholars a way to visualize their subjects, um, the way they, they change over time and space. Uh, as a sort of form of distant reading, which is um, fitting given that we're closing uh, tonight with uh, a history of uh, close reading. Uh, Chad Wellman was next. He gave us an account of a 19th century German philological project that involved hundreds of uh, researchers over decades in a form of what he called collective empiricism, a project that provided a model for present-day conversations on collaborative research in the humanities. Uh, Nadia Altschul was next. Um, she broke down some of our assumptions about national allegiances to particular philological methods in her talk, uh, showing that core interpretive methodolo methodologies established in Europe were then exported to scholars in colonial territories with a significant difference in the form of what she calls a coloniality of knowledge. Uh, and finally, Renz Bode, just last month, came uh, and gave us an overview of uh, a massive research project, book series, and ongoing conference series uh, to kickstart a discipline of the history of the humanities, arguing that from antiquity to the present, the humanities has constituted uh, the search for patterns. Uh, so tonight, it's absolutely fitting that Professor Smith rounds out our series, um, a scholar whose research spans aesthetics, culture, uh, and the sciences so completely and thoroughly, I had absolutely no idea where to begin tonight uh, introducing her. Um, I could start by saying that Professor Smith has a Wikipedia page, uh, which in itself is a great mark of distinction for an academic. Um, but I, I can say that I've never seen an academic's Wikipedia page as long as like a Cy Young award-winning pitcher. Um, <laughs> I saw it and thought, oh, this must be Barbara Smith the athlete, not the academic. Um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, Professor Smith has been a fellow with the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the National Humanities Center, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She is a member of the American, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is a former president of the Modern Language Association. Most recently, Professor Smith uh, was honored with the Society for Literature, Science, and the Arts Lifetime Achievement Award. Her books include Contingencies of Value, Alternative Perspectives for Critical Theory, uh, published in 1988, Belief and Resistance, Dynamics of Contemporary Intellectual Controversy from 1997, and most recently, Natural Reflections, Human Cognition at the Nexus of Science and Religion, published in 2010. Uh, but the book that had us most excited when we were planning for the series was 2005 Scandalous Knowledge, Science, Truth, and the Human, in which Professor Smith thoroughly pieces apart the science wars of the 1990s and argues that the so-called two cultures in the academy are actually complementary means of representing equally valuable sets of epistemic stances and intellectual practices. Um, so a useful lens worth thinking through. She writes, the gap between the two cultures is not a pathological condition to be healed, but rather a natural enough outcome of the dynamics of human cognition or indeed human ecology. All these forms of knowledge seeking with all their internal differences and mutual frictions are required for the maintenance and flourishing of our natural, which is to say cultural, which is also to say ethical, aesthetic, and reflective relation to our environments, including each other and the world we have created. 
Tonight, Professor Smith is going to be speaking with us about a very different topic, uh, the history of close reading as the central method to literary study since the 1940s, and what its heritage and afterlives are for us today. Uh, please join me in giving her a very, very warm welcome. Thank you for that very nice uh, introduction. It's good to have a Wikipedia page. I have to I look, look myself up and find out all of these things. Um, I appreciated uh, being invited here as a historian. Not usually a hat that I wear, but for a while now, I've been saying it's easy for me uh, to do intellectual history, at least of the 20th century. All I have to do is tell anecdotes about my life. Uh, so I'm not going to be telling any anecdotes uh, this evening, but I shall mobilize my 60 years in and around uh, the Literary Academy to address a double question. How did close reading figure in the Anglo-American literary studies over the course of the past century? And how does it figure now in the discourses of the digital humanities? At the end, I'll make some general comments about methods, past, possibly future, in literary studies. <coughs> Close reading, it's been said, is the primary methodology of literary studies. That's true in a sense, but the term methodology suggests something more coherent, circumscribed, and specifically research-focused than I think has been the case here. Reading individual texts with attention to their linguistic features and rhetorical operations is very different, of course, from subjecting large bodies of digitized materials to the sorts of computational processing now wittily and mischievously called distant reading. But the term close reading has been used to name some very diverse activities, from a new critic unraveling Shakespearean puns in the 1930s, to a Marxist scholar exposing the political unconscious of Victorian novels in the 1980s, or today, a first grader analyzing a book by Dr. Seuss in accord with the directives of the Common Core curriculum. If you want to know about that, just plug in close reading on YouTube and you get a whole lot of that. Very interesting. It's not quite a methodology, however. The practices of close reading have certainly been a persistent feature of Anglo-American literary studies. Indeed, their ongoing performance may be the one constant in a field notorious for its succession of new approaches. The parade is familiar from textbook rubrics, the old historical philology, followed by the new criticism, structuralism, reader response criticism, new historicism, feminist criticism, deconstruction, cultural studies, ideology critique, and so forth, with many others in between and after. Almost any parade becomes comical when it goes on long enough, and the succession of approaches in literary studies has been seen as showing the futility of all of them. There's good reason to reject that view, as I'll suggest later. But the point I want to stress now is that for all the shifts they reflect, every one of the approaches that I just mentioned from the new criticism, and indeed from the old historical philology, through deconstruction to ideology critique, involved reading individual texts closely. The texts varied from presumed literary masterpieces to works of popular culture and documents of manifest oppression. The discourses that directed their examination varied from Christian humanism to structural linguistics, to queer theory. And the spirit in which they were examined varied from the appreciative to the disinterested to the deeply suspicious. Nevertheless, throughout the 20th century, whatever the mood, motive, or materials, if one was teaching literature or doing literary criticism in the Anglo-American Literary Academy, one was likely to be reading at least some individual texts closely. So if, 
as seems to be the case, the practices of close reading have operated in literary studies not as one method among others, but as virtually definitive of the field, then how are we to understand a method whose advocates define it in opposition to, and indeed as superseding, precisely those practices? Depending on one's perspective, the ascendance of distant reading can be seen as marking the dissolution of literary studies, at least as a humanities a discipline, or as the proper elevation of the field into computational post-humanism. In arguments defending either of those two opposed views, various invocations of close reading, celebratory or derogatory, are a recurrent ploy. So I'll consider a few of those invocations, the derogatory, well, let's say, the ones that are framing uh, close reading in opposition to distant reading. I'm going to look at those later. Uh, I always explain, yes, I'm a specialist in controversy, but I'm a very peaceful person. I actually don't like fights myself at all, but I enjoy looking uh, at them, especially the intellectual kind. They're a lot of fun to look at. So first, a bit of history. And apologies to some of you for whom this is very old hat, and to the rest of you for whom it isn't old hat, it will be very skimpy, but um, that's, this is me as a historian. So uh, a close look at close reading. The term close reading refers not only to an activity with regard to texts, but also to a type of text itself, a technically informed, fine-grained analysis of some text, usually, and it's important, in connection with some broader question of interest. The practice has multiple ancestors, including classical rhetorical analysis, theological exegesis, and legal interpretation, and also some cousins, uh, such as iconology and psychoanalysis. All of these, the ones I mentioned, would have been familiar to the small group of highly accomplished British dons and poets whose efforts to reform literary study in the 1920s and 30s came to be called the New Criticism, and whose critical essays served as models for the practices that came to be called close reading. In its time, the new criticism was young, cool, and radical. I.A. Richards was a beginning instructor at Cambridge University when he assigned the classroom exercises in poetry reading that led to his influential book, Practical Criticism, published in 1929. Very briefly, he assigned uh, poems to students without identifying the authors and was appalled by the fact that they uh, complained about the obscurity uh, of famous, wonderful poets and loved, in effect, the greeting part verse. Uh, so having discovered that undergraduates don't know anything about reading poetry, he said about uh, understanding why it was that they didn't psychologist and also recommending uh, ways for them to think about poetry and that became the book Practical Criticism uh, uh, published in 1929. Uh, William Empson, uh, a student of Richard's, was 23 uh, when he wrote Seven Types of Ambiguity which became a paradigm of virtuoso close reading for several generations. That's the unraveling of the Shakespearean pun using psychoanalysis. Um, uh, T.S. Eliot's Sacred Wood Essays on Poetry and Criticism, published in 1920, excoriated dull scholarship from a position of confident connoisseurship <laughs> and set the standard for high-toned literary discriminations. The views and practices of this group were introduced to American readers <coughs> in the 1930s by the Southern poet and critic John Crow Ransom. And they were taken up with particular enthusiasm by two of his students, Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren. Uh, originally, they were his students at Vanderbilt, 
and then Brooks and uh, Robert Penoir both went to Yale. Um, uh, so the two of them, Brooks and Warren, co-authored a textbook titled Understanding <coughs> Poetry. It was first published in 1938, and it was immensely influential. By the time the second edition appeared in 1950, it was being assigned at over 250 colleges and universities in the United States. Uh, its chapter titles, Structure, Tension, Irony, Imagery, Rhythm, Tone, will, some of you will recognize these as the familiar concerns or obsessions of new critical choice reading. And its large collection of examples, including Poems for Further Study, uh, weighed heavily in the academic canon for decades afterward. Shakespeare's sonnets, Keats's odes, works by Browning, Tennyson, and Gerard Manley Hopkins, and modernist works by, among others, Ezra Pound, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, and William Carlos Williams. The new criticism was promoted as a corrective for the pedantries of early 20th century literary scholarship. But the practices of close reading themselves were promoted as a specifically pedagogic remedy for what was seen as the inadequacies of college students. Young men, almost exclusively men, we're speaking of the 1920s and 30s, who, in Cleant Brooks's words, quote, actually approached Keats's Ode to a Nightingale in the same spirit and with the same expectations with which they approached an editorial in the local county newspaper or an advertisement in the current Sears Roebuck catalog, end quote. Indeed, the popularity and persistence of those practices have often been attributed, not altogether unjustly, to their handiness for, for teachers. Some 40 years after the publication of Understanding Poetry, Hugh Kenneth, a learned critic of modernist poetry himself, remarked, quote, the curious thing is how a classroom strategy could come to mistake itself for a critical discipline. Kenner was being snide, but the association of close reading with pedagogy, as distinct from learned criticism, persisted through much of the century. So to return to the beginning of the history, uh, before the new criticism, in the first quarter of the century, the study of literature consisted largely of the production, transmission, and acquisition of facts about sets of texts. What one established as a, a scholar, imparted as a teacher, and learned as a student were commonly the names of historically important authors and some basic facts about their lives, the titles, publication dates, and sources, especially if they were classical, of their major works, relations of influence among them, and the readily observable features that distinguished forms, styles, and genres. The medieval romance, the Petrarchan sonnet, the Jacobean drama, and so forth. One could say that before the new criticism, literary study was distant reading with a vengeance. With the work of the new critics, it moved increasingly from filling library shelves with scholarly editions and literary histories to studying and describing how individual texts produced the effects that gave them historical importance or current interest. Against the historians and philologists who treated literary texts as dusty achievements, the new critics stressed literature as art. A poem wrote Ransom is a living object. As poets and wordsmiths themselves, they were interested in the craft of text making. As men of letters, Cambridge, Vanderbilt, Yale, yeah, they were appreciators of aesthetic effects. Though close reading is often described as a method of interpretation, the new critics, certainly the first generation of them, were concerned less with establishing the meaning of a text than with understanding its operative machinery. 
a new critical reading was something like an exercise in reverse engineering, the examination of an artifact to see how it was made and how it worked. The aims and spirit of the new criticism are well represented in an inaugural piece by Ransom, published in 1937, titled Criticism, Inc. Incorporated. He explains the title. Professors of literature are learned, but not critical men. Nevertheless, it is from the professors of literature that I should hope eventually for the erection of intelligent standards of criticism. It is their business. Perhaps I use a distasteful figure, but I have the idea that what we need is criticism incorporated or criticism limited. The figure or metaphor that is literary studies as a business would have been distasteful because literary academics understood that art and letters were remote from commerce. That shared understanding and the shared antagonism to big business and big industry created a bond and an otherwise strange fellowship between the socially and politically conservative Southern poets and the left-wing New York intellectuals, many of them at Columbia, who in the 1940s and 50s were the major advocates and practitioners of the new criticism in the United States. So uh, go back to Ransom's polemic or essay. So referring to the relation between historical scholarship and criticism, he's clear about which should be up front and on top. Quote, behind, behind the appreciation is historical scholarship. It is indispensable, but it is instrumental and cannot be the end itself. In this respect, historical studies have the same standing as linguistic studies, by which he meant philology. Language and history are aids. He also makes explicit the new critic's pedagogic mission. Quote, the students of the future must be permitted to study literature and not merely about literature. But I think this is what the good students have always wanted to do, the wonders that they have allowed themselves so long to be denied." End quote. Only toward the end of the essay does Ransom say what the new forms of literary study would consist in. And then in just a few phrases. They would be technical studies of poetry. For instance, in a particular poem, if they treated its metric, its inversion, its tropes, its fictions or inventions by which it secures aesthetic distance, or any other devices on the general understanding that any systematic usage which does not hold good for prose is a poetic device. Interesting one to talk a lot about that notion. Um, this is followed by a little bit of new critical mystery mongering, quote, the critic should regard the poem as nothing short of a desperate ontological or metaphysical maneuver. The poem celebrates the object which is real, individual, and qualitatively infinite. The critic knows that his practical interests will reduce this living object to a mere utility. Remember that uh, Ransom is himself both a poet and a critic, so his, 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 his switches back and forth are interesting. So the critic knows that his practical interests will reduce this living object to a mere utility and that his sciences will disintegrate it for their convenience into their respective abstract. The poet wishes to defend his object's existence against its enemy and the critic wishes to know what he is doing and how." End quote. Quite wonderful. And as I said, rather like reverse engineering. And he's doing this from both sides, both as the poet, the living object, which is the precious thing, but also as the critic, taking it apart to see how it manages to have the effects it has. It was often recalled that Ransom, like I.A. Richards before him, had summoned criticism to be more scientific. But his meaning and aim were often misunderstood or simply oversimplified. 
Here's the passage. Criticism must become more scientific, or precise and systematic. And this means it must be developed by the collective and sustained effort of learned persons, which means that its proper seat is in universities, in the university. It will never be a very exact science, or even a nearly exact one. But neither will psychology, if that term continues to refer to psychic rather than physical phenomena, smart guy, nor will sociology, nor even will economics. It does not matter whether we call them sciences or just systematic studies, and this is the part that I think is interesting. They have immeasurably improved in understanding since they were taken over by the universities, and the same career looks possible for criticism. So as I think it's clear, Ransom wasn't seeking to make literary criticism scientific in the positivist sense of the era, which, by the way, could be said of I.A. Richards, but he's sort of, which is quite wonderful, but also all over the place. I mean, that is, even though we wanted to make it scientific, I mean, it was still, he was still very interested in criticism as a normative uh, practice. And it's hard to put those together, that is to say, scientifically, psychologically. But he tried. What makes a good poem? If those of you who know whose work know that it has something to do with organizing uh, the neurons uh, uh, to put them in the right sort of combination that we expect to one another, which actually can be related to the conversation of beauty. But that's another sort of story that I'm not the sort that I'm telling here today. What I think is important is that Ransom wasn't seeking to make it scientific in the positivist sense. What he sought, rather, was to move criticism from the margins of the field to its center and to claim for its practitioners a form of technical expertise that elevated its status from an occasional pursuit, journalistic, uh, you know, man of letters, uh, to a duly accredited and properly housed academic program. If that sounds like what promoters of the digital humanity are seeking today, both for themselves and for the practices of distant reading, then it's very much to my point here, with all the historical ironies that doubling involves. Other doublings and ironies are apparent also in the um, hostile reactions that greeted the new criticism. They came, as Ransom anticipated, from, quote, the present incumbents of the professorial chairs, unquote, who he wrote derisively, quote, spend a lifetime in compiling the data of literature and yet rarely or never commit themselves to a literary judgment. And indeed, the incumbents of the professorial chairs came back. And a notable counter polemic appeared in 1949 in the pages of PMLA. Its author was Douglas Bush, an eminent Shakespearean scholar at Harvard, who, by the way, was a promoter of the Christian humanism that I have mentioned before, as you'll hear. Uh, Bush writes, quote, um, the new criticism, <laughs> you've got to hear the tones, and you have to hear the way in which these would have been pronounced. The new criticism the offspring of Mr. Richards and Mr. Elliot, has carried the marks of a mixed heredity. Their close reading of poetry has braced the flaccid sinews of this generation of readers and has had some highly beneficial effects upon teaching and writing, but a scholar historian may not be disposed to grant all its claims and assumptions. So it's clearly staking out there's the teachers, there's the writers, the, the scholar historians. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very clear when you look at it how these um, professional identities are operating. Uh, so the grudging concessions and the sense of strained dignity are familiar in the responses of upstage eminences. I'm sure those of you in digital humanities have encountered them especially that strange dignity. 
Uh, by the late 1940s, the hold of the old historicism had been effectively shaken. The Literary Academy was an increasingly lively place, and Bush could speak ruefully, but accurately, of the new critics, quote, tone of conscious superiority, end quote. Uh, in the essay, after chiding Ransom and others for gaffes, uh, reflecting their supposed ignorance of history, this became, at the time, and I, I was there at the time, it would always be, any time someone gave a magnificent reading, there would always be someone from the back of the room saying, I don't think it was 1740, it was 1742. <laughs> uh, you know, or give a different etymology for a word which showed that it operated in a quite different way in the poem. Um, but he also went on after uh, charging them with not knowing history, of course. Uh, he goes on to charge them with leaving ordinary readers out in the cold. The common reader might go so far as to think that poetry deals with life. However valuable the processes and results of the new criticism, for some readers it's preoccupation with technique its aloof intellectuality, its fear of emotion and action, its avoidance of moral values, all this suggests the dangers of a timid aestheticism. We would call it now formalism. Mm -hmm. Bush concludes with a bit of table turning, the charge, or rather, I think this is interesting, countercharge of scientism. Quote, Since poetry does, after all, deal with experience, the most fastidious fastidious critics have to touch on it, yet they may give the impression that they are looking not at human beings but at specimens mounted on slides. Indeed, though the critics have censured scholarship for aping science, and that was a charge against scholarship, dull, you know, just, just facts instead of being full of life, their own aims and methods seem much more deserving of the charge. So. End quote. Much of this is quaint, but also, I think, remarkably recognizable. Virtually the same set of general claims and charges were rehearsed throughout the century, irrespective of the methods or approaches at issue, and indeed irrespective of which side was being taken, revolutionary or counter-revolutionary. Thirty or forty years later, the same resentful tones would be heard from the new critics themselves, no longer young or cool or radical, <laughs> and, and now upstaged by deconstruction and what they call high theory. Ransom's reference to the vested interests of incumbent professors, the charge of elitism in Bush's invocation of the common reader, the exchange charges of hyperformalism and scientism, would recur in the theory wars of the 70s and 80s, in the canon wars of the 80s and 90s, and like much else in both these essays, in current polemics around the digital humanities. It looks like a pattern. It may even be a law of history. It's time to turn to Franco Moretti and the 21st century. close reading on the screen of the digital humanities. It was Moretti, of course, who broached the idea that literary studies would benefit from a turn away from close reading to a new set of practices that could be called distant reading. The key passage appears in an essay titled Conjectures on World Literature that originally was published in the year 2000. So this uh, a long passage. I'll, um, I'll read it, give you a chance to take it in, and then I'm going to comment on other people who pick up parts of it, and then I'll go back and look at Moretti again. Um, the trouble with close, uh, I'm, Moretti's a friend. I, I like him a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's like a lot of a tremendously interesting passage, every word of it, and you know both what it accomplishes beyond what I think he expected, and certainly beyond, in many respects, intended. The trouble with close reading and all of its incarnations from new criticism to deconstruction 
is that it necessarily depends on an extremely small canon. And if you want to look beyond the canon, close reading will not do it. It's not designed to do it. It's designed to do the opposite. At bottom, it's a theological exercise, very solemn treatment of very few texts taken very seriously. Whereas what we need is a little pact with the devil. We know how to read texts. Now let's learn how to not read them. Distant reading. Where distance, let me repeat, is a condition of knowledge. It allows you to focus on units that are much smaller or much larger than the text. Devices, themes, tropes, or genres and systems. And if between the very small and the very large, the text itself, admired and invoked by the new critic, disappears, well, it's one of those cases where one can justifiably say less is more. If we want to understand the literary system in its entirety, we must accept losing something. We always pay a price for theoretical knowledge. Reality is infinitely rich. Concepts are abstract, not poor. But it's precisely this poverty that makes it possible to handle them, and therefore to know. This is why less is actually more. Uh, very smart and the rhetoric is very neat, and the argument is whole, and several strong themes and claims echo in current arguments promoting the digital humanities now 15 years later. One is the theme of scale, the association of close reading with a few small things. Another is knowledge. Uh, you mentioned the, the epistemological stake. Yes, and they are absolutely essential. The summons to literary critics and scholars, in effect, to dare to know, to produce more abstract, theoretical, and comprehensive knowledge. And the third, the most consequential in institutional terms, is less is more. The suggestion that for literary studies to operate as a field of genuine knowledge production, scholars must sacrifice something, their interest in the text itself and the centrality of close reading to their practices. These themes and claims recur less playfully in the introduction to a recent book by Matthew Jockers titled Macro Analysis, Digital Methods and Literary History. Uh, Jockers is explicit in associating desirable epistemic aims with the aims of science and proper research methods with the methods used by scientists. The goal of science, he writes, quote, is to develop the best possible explanation for some phenomenon. This is done via a careful and exhaustive gathering of evidence. Literary studies should strive for a similar goal. Like science, he continues, literary studies should seek the best methods available for gathering evidence. And again, life science should, quote, welcome big data and scale its methods accordingly. Quote. It was Jocker's description of close reading as a methodology that I cited earlier. So here's the passage I was quoting. Quote, the study of literature relies upon careful observation the sustained, concentrated reading of a text, a text. This, our primary methodology, is close reading. Science has a methodological advantage in the use of experimentation. Experimentation offers a method through which competing observations and conclusions may be tested and ruled out. We are highly invested in interpretations, and it is very difficult to rule out an interpretation. So then, uh, after a passage in which he grants the value of literary interpretation in some regards, he does some things, he continues. But interpretation is fueled by observation, and as a method of evidence gathering, observation is flawed. Despite all their efforts to repress them, researchers will have irrepressible biases. Observation is flawed in the same way that generalization 
from the specific is flawed. The selection of the sample is always something less than perfect, and so the observed results are likewise imperfect. Jock, Jockers uh, believes that big data is solving or helping solve these problems in the sciences, and writes. Big data are fundamentally altering the way that much science and social science get done. Many areas of research are no longer dependent upon controlled artificial experiments or upon observations derived from data sampling. All right. Many areas of research and science no longer dependent upon artificial experiments or observations derived from data. And he argues big data should change the game in literary studies as well. Quote, back in the 1990s, gathering literary evidence meant reading books, noting things, a phallic symbol here, a biblical reference there, a stylistic flourish, an illusion, and so on, and then interpreting. Today, in the age of digital libraries and large-scale book digitation projects, the nature of the evidence available to us has changed radically. Massive digital corpora offer us unprecedented access to the literary record and invite even demand a new type of evidence gathering and meaning making. The literary scholar of the 21st century can no longer be content with random things gathered from a few even representative texts. Like it or not, Today's literary historical scholar can no longer risk being just a close reader. The sheer quantity of available data makes the traditional practice of close reading untenable as an exhaustive, or it, it says definite, but I'm sure it's a typo for definitive method of evidence gathering. Am I sure? Yes, I'm sure. I just want to say something that makes sense. Um, so there's much to query here about Jocker's view of science as well as of literary studies, uh, but I'll focus on a few central points. First, gathering evidence for claims is not a good way to describe research in most scientific fields. And generating interpretations by reading books and noting things randomly and foolishly is a singularly bad way to describe what literary scholars did in the 1990s or at any other time. More significant, so there's a hostility there. You know, you just feel that. You know, and this is what we did in the 1990s. So this, this the floating we, where we are literary studies, but the we is you, not, not me. <laughs> First, um, oh, um, oh, more significantly, close reading never figured in literary studies as a definitive way to gather evidence much less an exhaustive way. In the case of critical studies that are focused on the thought or style or achievement of particular authors, the close reading of texts by those authors would have to be central to any claims made. That's obvious. But even there, and certainly where broader historical claims or cultural claims are involved, it would be remarkable for a literary scholar not to consult and invoke other documents and other types of data. The digital library is exceedingly handy for accessing such materials, but scholars' shelves have not been otherwise empty up to now. Jockers is saying that literary historians can no longer risk being something that they never have been, that is, as he says, just close reading. So we have a strong Second, the fact that some way of doing things is now possible doesn't make it necessary, as in Jockers' term, demand. Where big data is pertinent, and it often is, and computational processing would be useful, and it often is, literary scholars should take advantage of both. But there's no research imperative built into the size of some potential data set. New methods enable new questions to be posed, and old answers to be sharpened or corrected. But in any field of knowledge production, 
significant questions come out of ongoing interests and problems, not out of the methods available to answer them. Digital libraries and powerful search engines have already become research tools for most literary scholars. Those who are still in a cave on these matters are well advised to become familiar with such resources and the types of projects they enable, which many of them don't know. Also, it's understandable that those already working on such projects would want to urge others to explore such resources as possible avenues to interesting new research for themselves. But Jaku seems to be urging or cautioning more than that in his like it or not address to his colleagues. What people in literary studies are apt to hear him saying is that the existence of those massive digital corpora has made their current way of doing things inappropriate, impractical, and untenable, and that they should do instead what he does. A third point is important here. Jocker suggests that computational methods and big data, and he's not the only one, but I picked it out because recent book, it has the title, you know, Digital Methods in Literary History. It's the subject that I was writing. It just came out, and it has received, at least as far as I can see, a uh, very strong endorsement from uh, the digital humanities community. So I was interested in it and, you know, sort of interested in what it was doing, but also bothered um, by the way in which it was being presented. And uh, again, this, he is a representative text, right? Uh, have I, I've been reading quite a bit in digital humanities over the past year, but not every text, absolutely not everyone. A third point is important. Jockers suggests that computational methods and big data allow researchers to avoid or mitigate the subjectivity and bias built into human observation, and also what he calls the flaw of generalizing from less than exhaustive data set. But the idea or ideal of objective observation, like that of complete data sets, in effect, inspecting every swan before concluding anything about the color of swans, has been effectively challenged by a century of empirical and theoretical work in the history, sociology, and philosophy of science. I should add that Jacques is not alone among contemporary literary scholars in his enthusiasm for, but rather old-fashioned view of science. For all the talk of paradigm shifts among so-called literary Darwinists and advocates of cognitive cultural studies, the images of science to which they appeal tend to be essentially pre colonial so my allusion, of course, is to Thomas Kuhn, mentioned earlier, whose account of paradigm shifts in the history of chemistry and physics challenged simple progressivist views of how science developed. His major work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, was published in 1962. But even more pertinent here is Paul Feyerabend's once scandalous, now for many people, celebrated volume, published in 1975, titled Against Method. So I thought you'd enjoy that mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the workshop, for the seminar series. We got that. <laughs> yes. Uh, to, uh, you know, it's a pretty good pose. I mean, he's usually looking pretty cute with his hat on an angle or something. Like that. <laughs> he was an opera singer and an actor and an all-around bad boy. Bad hat, very much like Moretti. Very mischievous and had that same wonderful, you know, large knowledge and uh, very quick way of formulating things. But the point, what, to the central question posed by philosophers of science then and now, uh, less now than then, what methods lead scientists to new discoveries and successful theories? The prevailing answer was Karl Popper's conjectures and refutations, or the so-called hypothetical deductive method. Uh, it's not an accident that um, Moretti's essay was called Conjectures on World Literature. 
references to Popper are all the way through that essay in my Gibbons work. Um, so to that question, um, the prevailing answer was, you know, the hypothetical deductive method laid out a set of rules, and then you do this, then you experiment, then you predict, then you test the prediction against the experiment. Then Firebend's answer was anything goes. Anything goes. Contrary to outraged misreadings of his argument, he wasn't claiming that scientists are capricious, but that they're inventive, resourceful, and opportunistic. His examples included Galileo and Newton and um, Einstein. His major point in against method was that there's no set of rules for success in science, no specifiable, generalizable way to make discoveries or to produce persuasive, usable theories. The trouble with telling literary scholars to be more like scientists in their methods is not that it's scientific, though it's that as well, but that it tells them nothing in particular. Jocker's worries over the methods used in literary studies are largely misplaced. The fact that a critic's interpretation is based in part on her observations as a particular reader doesn't compromise the interest or usefulness of the interpretation. The same is true of a scholar's historical account or theoretical claim, too. Of course, that particularity and inevitable but not necessarily pernicious bias, in other words, it's just particular perspective, that particularity leaves the interpretation or the claim or the account open to dispute by other readers or scholars. But at the same time, that grounding in personal observation and experience opens the possibility of shareable insights and connection to shareable experiences, which is what typically motivates our interest in a literary interpretation as such. And along with connection to broader intellectual issues and other concerns, that grounding and attendant possibility, shareable insights, and connection to shareable experiences also sustain the value of much historical and theoretical research in the humanities as such. So here I just have to sigh. There's a long story to tell, and I think it's being told elsewhere at this uh, time on this very campus between the, the sciences and the humanities. You mentioned that. A long story to tell, which I've tried to tell elsewhere and continue to try to tell, about the differences of epistemic aim, achievement, and value in the humanities and the sciences. But it's clear, I think, that a central question here, it's just a, a question to be considered, is whether scholarly and critical method in a field like literary studies is properly assessed by research method in a field like geology. That's the specific science that Jockers invokes in an opening anecdote as having led during a Thanksgiving dinner conversation with a representative scientist to his embarrassment at being unable to defend the way research was done in his own field. And I do wonder how much scientism in the humanities is created by that feeling of embarrassment when some scientist explains the hypothetical deductive method, which he's not using anyway, very, very clearly. <laughs> And the humanist has nothing to offer. Well, yeah, no, we don't experiment exactly. And, you know, so, but that embarrassment, I think, uh, can be traumatic, and maybe it was. More use of big data or computer algorithms by literary scholars won't solve the methodological problems that Jaffa sees in literary studies. The problems, if that's what they are, are built into standard scholarly practice in the field, the legacy of classical humanistic practices reinforced by various contemporary approaches, notably new historicism and deconstruction, and for other reasons, and I could go into that psychoanalytic criticism, why it is that those particular approaches reinforce certain classical uh, uh, ways of doing um, reading. The only way to end the embarrassment at what literary critics and literary historians do 
would be to persuade them to do something else instead, something more like social science research. And that seems, in fact, to be what Jockers and Moretti and various other advocates of the digital humanities are promoting, not perhaps to cease doing critical interpretive studies altogether, but to do less of it and more of what they themselves do, that is, research in which the data consists of very large numbers of unread texts, and the questions asked are independent of and largely irrelevant to the literary or other traditionally humanistic interests of those texts. Less is more, perhaps. Moretti calls the exchange he proposes less close reading for more genuine knowledge, a little pact with the devil. Pacts with the devil, even what look like little ones, deserve scrutiny. Famously, one ends up getting less than one bargained for and losing more than one thought. Moretti is right to describe close reading as a theological exercise, not, however, in the sense, as he suggests, of the reverential examination of a very few number of texts, but in the sense of an expansive commentary on one. In literary studies, whether in classrooms or journal articles, a close reading is typically the occasion for more general observations and often for wide-ranging reflections. They may be observations about the style or genre of the text at hand or about its author or the era in which it was written, but there are often observations and reflections, more or less subtle, more or less original, as teachers and scholars are more or less subtle, more or less original, about related human circumstances and experiences. And even when not especially subtle or original, they can afford readers, students, some insight into and a sense of connection with the circumstances and experiences of people who are otherwise remote. Contrary to charges raised across the years, the practices promoted by the new criticism did not require that readers forget history or ignore the outside world. Full dress close reading, now as ever, can be showy or strained. I've encountered quite a number of they can also be, as I'm sure all of you are in literary studies would agree, they can also be dim, thin, derivative, or pedestrian, and when motivated by a history of injury, sulky, and venomous. But now as ever, they can offer those who hear or read them potentially illuminating engagements with regions of language, thought, and experience not otherwise commonly encountered. Now, I don't want to sing an aria uh, to close reading. That really isn't where I want to go here. Okay, but that much can at least be said, so that if you say less close reading, it should be at least clear what it is that close reading involves. Close reading makes a neat contrast to distant reading, but not, I think, a pertinent one for promoting the value of digital resources and computational methods for literary studies. My final example here is a pair of brief passages and again, quite recently, co-authored book titled Digital Ligature Humanities. The ligature indicated the closeness of the association. Um, referring to the, Um, referring to the tools necessary to thoughtfully, uh, by the way, this is the authors are Anne Burdick, Joanna Drucker, Peter Lunenfeld, Todd Pressner, and Jeffrey Schnapp. Uh, so, um, and the book is called Digital. Referring to the tools necessary to thoughtfully and meaningfully sift through, analyze, visualize, map, and evaluate the deluge of data the digital age has unleashed, they write, quote, one way of navigating this process is through distant reading, a form of analysis that focuses on larger units. It is a term that is 
specifically arrayed against the deep hermeneutics of extracting meaning from a text through ever closer microscopic readings. And a page later, they amplify this. Close reading has its roots in the philological traditions of the humanities, but for more than a generation has often been equated with deep hermeneutics and exegesis, techniques in which interpretations are excavated from a text to ever closer readings of textual evidence, references, word choices, semantics, and registry." End quote. So I think both descriptions are awkwardly phrased, and perhaps that reflects, and I think it did, I mean, five authors collaborating. Uh, collaboration is great, but it's very hard to produce good prose. If you, and they insist <laughs> that they all are responsible for every sentence. It's different. I mean, I've collaborated all these you know, uh, chapters and so forth, but five authors on every sentence. So I think it reflects ideas inserted at various times. Well, why don't you say that too? Put that in by each of the five authors who collaborated in the production. But especially notable is just the oddness of some of that language. Uh, we generally speak of inferring and identifying meanings and of offering and suggesting interpretations, not extracting and excavating them like teeth, oil, or corpses. <laughs> Also odd are the phrases ever closer and ever closer microscopic. Yeah, close reading often involves attention to features such as word choice or in connection with rhyme or alliteration to individual sounds or letters, but there's nothing like a microscopic lens being focused ever closer as if obsessively or maniacally. Like the rather violent extract or creepy excavate, such language makes the practices so described sound unpleasant, unnatural, and certainly very alien. But that's not the point I want to make. More significantly here, and contrary to the contrast being drawn, attention to microfeatures, of course, doesn't distinguish the practices of close reading from those of digital humanities. We recall Moretti's inaugural description. Distant reading allows you to focus on units that are much smaller, or much larger than the text, devices, themes, tropes, or genres and systems, end quote. And in fact, the tagging and counting of very small textual units figures centrally in many digital humanities projects, including studies by Moretti himself. So I'm going to talk about this, uh, just a little bit about this article of his titled Style Incorporated. Um, style incorporated reflections on 7,000 titles, British novels, 1740 to 1850. Uh, so I'm not going to quote them, I'm just going to describe it. Uh, Moretti displays the results of a study correlating, so, so he has all of <laughs> He puts uh, these 7,000 titles through the machine and he gets out, uh, he's able to correlate the length, the grammatical structure, and other very specific features of those 7,000 titles with the number of novels published in each decade. And he goes on to note historical trends in the occurrence of those features, including in the later decades, as the number of novels published increases over that period, um, the use of the indefinite article A versus the definite article V as in the title, A Mummer's Wife versus The Infidel Father, two titles uh, that he mentioned. So A versus B. Uh, this deferential usage, he suggests, signaled to prospective consumers faced with a lot of novels to read. What do I want to read? Well, it tells you that a particular novel offered respectively either a progressive or a conservative point of view on social development. Moretti elaborates the suggestion with considerable subtlety, teasing out the respective connotations of A and V in an analysis that might have left William Ensign gasping with admiration. For example, I mean, and this is one of his observations, and it's not wrong. 
A, as in a wife, is unrestricted and leaves the future open, whereas B, as in the father, is restricted and grammatically oriented to the past, the father that was mentioned. Of course, Moretti's interpretation of the data he's gathered can be challenged. His account of the different connotations of A and V is based at least in part, in part on his subjective observation. Here, as a practiced reader and writer of the English language, not merely a practice one, but student well too. And other explanations of the historical trends he identified <coughs> could be, and in fact have been offered. What's significant for, the, for my argument here is that that would be true mutatis mutandis of the interpretation of the results of a study in any field, whatever the size of the data and however rigorous the computation. That is, the grounding of the interpretation and the potentially compelling but inevitably limited observations of particular human beings. But, second part of the argument, that's also what gives an interpretation its interest for and appropriability by fellow human beings. You could see it as an exchange, less putative and I would say spurious objectivity for more actual interest and usefulness. That's a pretty good bargain. The law of literary history that Moretti discovers or illustrates here is that stylistic features of literary texts, titles in this case, reflect market forces. Hence the ink in his own title, Style Ink, which recalls, of course, the title of John Crow Ransom's essay, Criticism Ink, and, and, and it may involve a glancing allusion, though he doesn't say so, but it may even involve a glancing recollection. Ransom, you'll recall, was suggesting that criticism is the proper business of literary study, and noted that his readers might find the term distasteful. Contrary to the old genteel humanist view of art and letters as remote from commerce, Moretti is suggesting that literature is a business like everything else. He means it provocatively, but his critical inquiry readers are not likely to find the association of art with the market offensive or surprising. It's been some years, nearly a century, I think, since literary studies was the solemn treatment of very few texts. In other words, right. So now my conclusion. <clears throat> if you live a long time, you accumulate a lot of data. So I'll conclude with some general observations. Um, see if I can get back there. As I noted earlier, the succession of methods or approaches over the past century is not, in my view, a sign of futility or failure. What it reflects, rather, are ongoing efforts by scholars, earnest, uh, to make their teaching and research responsive to developments within and beyond the academy, efforts that are joined and sometimes undercut by the operation of dynamics that are general and recurrent enough to be called laws of history, at least of academic history. So well, this is Smith's first law of academic history. Everybody always overdoes everything. Professional pressures inspiration energized by competition, push scholars into exhibiting the methods and virtues most conspicuously valued at the moment, and these tend to be escalated and intensified to the point of exhaustion of the material, absurdity of the method, or pathology of the virtue. Uh, the virtue which I think has become exceedingly pathological is formalism in analytic philosophy as an example of more formal than that. And you can, you can think of comparable uh, virtues that have become uh, um, uh, hypertrophic that way. A second set of forces giving weight to perennial calls for reform or revolution are chronic tensions between fundamental but opposed impulses and styles, notably in literary studies between populism and elitism, 
moralism, including political moralism and formalism, and subjectivism, or what could be called phenomenologism, and objectivism, or what could be called scientism. And a third law follows from the interaction of the first two, and we've seen uh, examples of this all the way through my talk. Everybody complains of being misrepresented and caricatured, and everybody is misrepresented and caricatured. <laughs> Douglas Bush complained of the new critics' cavalier dismissal of historical scholarship, and Ransom's treatment of it was pretty good. The developments to which scholars were responding during the 20th century were quite significant. Literary study was one thing when a small number of Christian men were teaching the professionally aspiring sons of fellow professionals. It became another when members of an expanding professoriate were teaching students from middle and working class families, and later when a sizable number of faculty were women and a sizable number of their students were from racial and ethnic minorities. And the field is yet another thing now, when faculty and students are more likely to encounter texts on screens than anywhere else, and when everyone is scrambling for positions, funding, and status in a shrinking quarter of the academy. Over the course of the century, in literary studies, as in other fields, the responses to changing institutional conditions and broader developments commonly led not to revolutionary overturns, but to shifts of relative, relative dominance. And there were always extensive residues of prior practices. The field was never taken over by the new criticism or any other single movement and remained, not unhappily, I think, eclectic. The parade in the street was noisy and colorful, but up in the libraries, historians continued to write literary history, editors continued to produce editions of literary works, and in both libraries and classrooms, almost everybody read at least some texts, more or less closely. Some changes of practice in literary studies proposed by advocates of the digital humanities would be revolutionary, and the developments that they observe and cite as requiring them from the technological to the neurological, are, in their eyes, no less so. Talk of seismic and tectonic shifts is pervasive. Clearly, though, the interest and utility of close reading don't vanish in the face of digital libraries or ubiquitous computation. On the contrary, in the century upon us, where channels of communication are not only increasingly computerized, but also increasingly corporatized, and where texts of all kinds are turned to manipulative ends with digitally multiplied effectiveness, the ability and disposition to read texts attentively one by one, along with, of course, digital sophistication, is likely to be an advantage. That ability and disposition also remains more generally crucial. The hope of receiving such reading such as this, is what keeps most of us, scholars and researchers, as well as poets and novelists, writing. And the actual, even if only occasional, fulfillment of that hope is what keeps much textual production, literary and other, going. It's a practice that we all have a stake in preserving. Thank you. Thank you very much. The fact is that I am hard of hearing, oh, and so I it's see. necessary for me to see you in order to hear you. I was asking only one. No, I understand. Of, but uh, I, I was wondering how you understand uh, that other challenge, recent challenge to close reading that has nothing to do with big data or macro analysis, but rather that picks up on that, that Jeffrey Schnapp line with the excavation and ever closer and uh, so hermeneutics and so on, um, namely uh, surface reading. 
Yeah, I have uh, heard Heather Love, and I read the uh, the Sharon Marcus Stephen Best uh, piece, and uh, I, you know, it seems to me that it, it is meaning a great many things, and it is responding to a great many things. So it's very hard to give you know a simple answer. I, I would have to then break it down. Uh, uh, to the extent that, let's say, Heather Love is saying that we're looking for hidden things and we are ignoring um, what authors were interested in pr providing us with, let us not be looking for hidden things and look at what is being offered to us. That seems very, very reasonable to me. Okay. Um, some of the other, uh, you know, the notion that um, close reading always involves, I mean, this very, very um, strange language of excavation and so forth. I think uh, you know, some ideology critique has been, you know, as I said, sometimes, and it's often a history of injury, has been then, and the idea that it might be a good idea to let up on some of that uh, because of it's not the most effective um, instrument uh, politically uh, or intellectually. Uh, I think that I can understand those, those motives. So, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. I want to uh, go to the point uh, that you made in your lecture where, when you were, if I was great, it was great. I was the, I'm sorry I was laughing. I was just laughing at the, like the, the amazingness of the lecture and the, all these amazing points that you made. Um, it was not meant to be uh, anything but admiration. But I want to go to the point um, where you're talking about Moretti and the idea of sociology of literature. Um, because I, I think there's another side to what a lot of people around that school are arguing, and I'd like to hear what you think about it. Mm -hmm. Namely that when you when you work on large models of literature, of course what you can you can unearth, to mm -hmm. use another one of those languages, yeah. right, is a pattern, right? To use another word that's yeah. very common, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is the use of an article a you know an indefinite article, a definite article, but there might actually be larger, let's say, uh, uh, patterns or let's say topics or themes that that cross that cross um, between texts that we know and texts that we don't know mm -hmm. that allow us to think about the critique of the incommensurability of the canonical object, literary object, or. If you, if you see what I mean. The the of, well, to, uh, to pull apart the idea, because there are some people right now who are, you know, and this happens in canonical art, in the, in the canonical wars, right? Mm -hmm. That, that you, and you yourself said it when you're talking about, about close reading, right? Close reading can prop up objects as mm -hmm. um, canonical oh, sure. objects. So I'm just wondering, because I think that one of the arguments that, that gets made in that Meridian school is that we expand the number of texts that we read, and therefore we find larger seas of, of topics and themes, yes. right, okay. that actually are there, right? There are a number of things that you're saying that I certainly, I mean, there are some strong things that I want to say. Being sociological is not objectionable, in my view. Okay. I would just say, just to identify it, okay. it is important. Uh, I, you know, I, wrote, I wrote a book called Poetic Closure, a study of how poems end, poems, it didn't say some poems. It didn't say the poems I know. It didn't say American poems. It said poems. Right. That was about as ambitious as you could get. And, you know, a, a couple of years of judicious sampling, but not every poem. It got to the point that I would present what I had to say and say, can you think of an, an exception to what I'm saying? You know, when they, and I would ask myself. I would look at anthologies, I would score things. At the point where I found no exceptions to what I was saying, I stopped looking at swans. Okay. So, uh, and, um, you know, Moretti's, uh, I, I do know, Franco, from way back when, we were both interested in structuralism and, you know, both besotted with uh, scientism, which is an admiration for science I have no objection to either. Uh, so all of these things have to be examined in their specific formulations, what the claim is, what the argument is, where it would go, and you also have to worry about the uptake of it. Um, I don't know whether you're thinking of Matthew Wilkins' argument, because I, right. you know, right. I, I stopped at one hour. 
Okay, that was the other example. Right. And the, Matthew was a student of mine. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it, it, his argument, I think, is interesting to the extent that he, the way that you put it, I think, is very good. In other words, to consider that which we are familiar with um, in relation to as much as we can lay our hands on is can be very revealing. I can reveal that we've been mistaken uh, about something being exceptional or something being representative. That, that is the case. Uh, but I think that Moretti's initial identification of close reading was requiring a very small can and the notion that doing computational studies will somehow solve the moral problem of the canon, which is the fact that there are many things that are not read for objectionable uh, reasons. Uh, those are two points where I think it's quite weak. I don't think that people who object to the canon for not being inclusive of various groups who work on the basis of social bias never considered, I don't think excluded, but totally just not thought about, not read, ignored, and so forth. Counting them is not going to solve that problem. Putting them in the pile and having them counted does not solve that problem. So that problem is reading them. So, uh, the other thing that I think is uh, dubious is the idea that close reading confines the number, confines the data. No matter how many people there are who individually can only read X number of books in their scholarly lifetime, not, that does not in itself limit the data that's available. I, when I was writing Poetic Closure many, many years ago in the early 60s, uh, nobody was uh, talking about oral poetry. But I, I wondered whether it worked the same way uh, for uh, So I looked at transcriptions of oral poetry from Ruth Finnegan, who was at the time uh, the person who was promoting it. So nobody else that was, was in no anthology later on it got to be. So but no, the fact that close reading or that there was a canon, and there certainly was at that time, a, a group of what was considered historically important and culturally significant texts. Um, uh, but that didn't stop. I can here only use myself as an example of any scholar is free to examine any data in spite of the fact that one by one, 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 we can only read a certain number, and that there is, that there tends to be, uh, not because of close reading, as Matthew Wilkins suggests, but uh, close reading doesn't create canon. It can support them. Is that, that yeah, gets to exactly the okay, good. Um, I, I want to come back to the, the, the way you began the talk, which is there, this, this conversation repeats itself over and over and over and in similar shape and in similar tone. That was really remarkable to kind of find, uh, find and recognize a similar tone. And what I find so strange about this whole history and about this uh, debate is their binary nature, the either or nature. It is as if kind of the people with the telescope said, you cannot study nature with microscopes. Microscopes must be banned. Only telescopes, yeah. right? That's, that's a strange move in any field, yeah. right? So why yeah. not add? Why not just expand the, the methodological toolkit? So it seems like there's something else, something else at stake. It's either a political, I'm trying to understand the origin of the tone and the origin of that the kind of oh, binary This is a very, this is a what, very, what? very interesting question, which is really part of um, controversy study. Uh, in the book, Belief and Resistance, <laughs> okay. Uh, what I am suggesting is that there's a combination of psychological, sociological, institutional pressures that leads to an array of positions being binarized, polarized, hierarchized. That happens over and over again. I mentioned some of them jokingly, like everybody always overdoes everything, that's certainly part of it, that you get pressures to exaggerate uh, in order to show, look, he got a job. What was his, what did he do? What did he do about? Well, I can do that with this. All right, so that, that produces this, let's say, in, inspiration and competition. You find something admirable, you do it, only want to do it a little bit better 
than the other guy. So this is, you know, uh, as we know, that kind of effect. Uh, and then we have these continuing um, d um, opposed, fundamentally, uh, they're fundamental, but they are opposed to each other. So I would say that the impulse to what my, what I, the terms that I really prefer are from anthropology. Uh, and that would be emic and etic. That is the insider perspective and the outsider perspective. I think they are equally fundamental and they are opposed to one another. And the desire, if we get too much uh, touchy-feely, then we're going to have a call for more science. If we get too remote from experience, we're going to have a call for to pull us back then. So that, that's a part of the dynamic is fundamentally, fundamental, eternal, you know, they're built in, emic and edict as two possibilities of cognitive orientation. And I also think, of course, that they are represented in the humanities and the uh, sciences more generally, but they also get in a fractal way represented within the human. In other words, within the sciences, there are, if you like, more emic and more edict and within the humanities, also more objectivist and more phenomenological uh, approaches. So um, it, it's, a, it's a, a wonderful question, and it doesn't have a simple answer. It has you know, an answer that consists of looking at a lot of uh, different forces, phenomena. I really, really enjoyed your talk, uh, first of all, let me say. Uh, I particularly love that you mentioned Pyrodan, because <laughs> he doesn't get mentioned enough, particularly in this context and this discussion. So thank you very much for that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention too, uh, that just comes up, uh, especially like Moretti's styling, right? There we see him doing distant reading, but he's really doing close reading too, right? He's just distant reading just, I mean, so, so I entirely agree with this kind of strange, how these things get uh, distant and close reading get uh, posed as these antithetical things when that doesn't make any sense at all, even for the people who do just who claim to do distant reading, whoever those people are. Also, one more thing, and then I'll ask a question, I promise, which is, uh, so uh, a lot of people mention uh, Matthew Drucker's book, uh, Macronalysis, as like the thing that DH people think. Uh, but I just want to say, and every time I hear that, which I hear a lot, uh, I always cringe, uh, because most of the people that, that I know who self-identify as uh, DHers uh, have a lot of concerns with that book. Uh, wow. so some of which you mentioned. So I would just say, in the DH community, actually, it's not uh, maybe quite the way that it's frequently portrayed. Uh, but the question then, uh, I really love the idea of using close reading to uh, look at how newness is treated in, in professional spheres, right? Like how, how it's you know, treated a close reading discipline, and then you know, how we see these similar things with, uh, with distant reading. Uh, with Moretti's work and, and Jockers and, and any other people. Uh, so is there a way uh, <coughs> in looking at this notion of operationalizing, op 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 uh, that's the word uh, that Moretti uses, right? Where you take basically an algorithm that's just, just counting things, right? And you try and use that as a way of pointing to a concept, like a character, or in Jockers position, like you count positive sentiment in sentences mm -hmm. to like measure plot, right? Uh, but of course, if you look at the algorithm itself, it's like this, this black hole, right? Because like, in fact, there's a whole bunch of assumptions about what the algorithm makes. Uh, to really look at what the algorithm's doing, you look at how the corpus was, was constructed, right? How, how the data was, and that maybe involves historical work. You're looking at, you know, how were these novels digitized in the first place? All these things. Sorry, getting to the point, which is, uh, is there like an analogous case in close reading? I, mean, I think there probably certainly is. Right, where, where we say, like, well, we just do these things in close reading, but it's, it's a black hole too, right? The, the closer you look at a particular technique, the more differences you find. So is there like a parallel we can, we can maybe make between close oh, reading? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> let me just underline something that you just enacted rather than asked and say, I think that that's a very wonderful direction that I see as the more I get involved in reading the DH, and that is that the internal criticism uh, mm -hmm. multiplies. And that's, of course, a sign of that things are going well. When you just get defensive hostility, okay? 
that's a, a sure recipe uh, for self stultification and a, a, a field doesn't develop. That did happen an awful lot in literary Darwinism, you know, just absolutely slamming any opponent. And uh, I mean, I don't know what his fortunes right now. I sort of stopped looking at that and started looking at digital humanity. Um, I think it, it's going to be hard. I'm, I'm sure that there's there are analogs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd have to think in order to produce something that was neat and interesting and worth thinking about. Uh, but just as digital humanities and distant learning consist of many different practices and also many different practitioners, some better than others. Uh, one can find in close reading, as I say, a multiplicity of um, uh, activities, motives, materials, some of which are, you know, uh, it, the, the ever closer is not something that occurs um, as uh, part of the practice. Anson, nobody ever outdid Anson in being able to team except Moretti, okay, and able to tease something out of, you know, five different puns in a single uh, line uh, of a Shakespeare song, you know. And they were all, you know, they were all plausible. Uh, and um, what I think happened, and this is maybe the closest thing to it, when I was saying, when everybody overdoes everything, you get the exhaustion of the material, the absurdity of the method, the pathology of the virtue. Okay. So that's always potential in, in close reading, and it's been realized. As I said, there are, there are dreadful close readings. Um, and um, one thinks of, in trying to describe a method, one tries to bear in mind uh, the, you know, the full array of how, how that helps. Does that help? Does that answer the question? Yes. It's very yes. useful. It's great. It's been okay. Good. Yes, sure. Just wonder if the virtue might seem more healthy or lively or um, you know vital if sometimes literary critics would go outside of the academic and look at fields like advertising or marketing or even the military where. It is very shocking to find out that there's a major study going on of metaphor across cultural boundaries. So what if literary critics started to engage more with tropes and figures of speech and interpretations that go on in, in daily life all the time? Yeah. Is that happening now? Well, uh, it did happen a great deal. That was a very major thing. I, went by it if I said the history was going to be a little skimpy. But yes, uh, I mentioned that the materials became popular culture. And some key works uh, of deconstruction and of a structuralist criticism uh, did involve taking apart advertising slogans and uh, television characters. And uh, there was. Uh, the field of semiotics, which I didn't mention, but would go along with structuralism uh, as part of a, as a midsum. That was it. Simply um, enlarged the notion of what a text was, so that uh, it became the case that the close reading of a text could be close reading of clothing, of facial expressions, of architecture, until you, you reach the point where there was literally no artifact that could not be uh, treated uh, as a text and, uh, let's say, subjected to uh, a, an analysis of how its features operated in relation to one another formally in order to create the effects that it had. And I think that that's absolutely legitimate. So uh, the, uh, the why don't they? Uh, they do. And they did. And, and, and it's become, I'd say, pretty explosive. I, I, I guess I'm thinking more of how would, how would Emson have done something similar if he had been writing instead of about ambiguity in, in his text by Shakespeare in a 
Yeah, well, that, yeah, that, that is, that's a claim that's been made for close reading, which I didn't pursue, but certainly it's an honorable claim, and that is when you are a close reader, then you can close read anything, right? Usefully, usefully. As I, we're running a little late, I'm sorry to cut this short, but um, let's all please thank our speaker very much.